Hello everyone. So in this video, we're going to look into the most exciting part of IGCSE physics, which is space physics. And in this chapter alone, we're going to look into the Earth and also the solar system only. And in the next video, we're going to look into the sun and also the universe. And the first part of the video, we'll be looking at why day and night occurs. And the reason this occurs is because of the Earth rotation on its own axis. And one way to picture this is that let's say this is the sun and you are resident in this part of the earth, then you probably will experience daytime because the sun is shining on you. But if you're on the other side of the earth, you probably be experiencing nighttime because that's not where, where the sun is shining. So that's how day and night occurs. And as for months, as you all know, um, as the days goes on in a month, we will see different version of the moon. And that's not because the moon is got like eaten by somebody else. That's mainly because of um, the theory that we have learned called the reflection of light. So I have a diagram here. Um, you can see that moon is orbiting the earth. So moon will orbit around the earth. And that will affect how the sunlight reaches the earth when we look at the moon. Because as the moon is at different part of the earth, it, it's going to be reflecting light in a different way. Hence, this is why we will see different moon um, at different time. And the moon, as stated here, they orbit around the Earth for around 27.5 days in for one turn. And that's how um, the concept of month comes on. And as for years, we know that um, in some countries, they experience different seasons. That's also because of how um, the Earth orbits around the Sun. So if you look at um, the notes here, they say that the Earth will orbit around the Sun for around 365 days per year. That's what that. And then you can also see that the Earth here is a little tilted. And because of this, the Earth experiences four seasons. So let me explain. Imagine that we only look at to the Earth here. Let's say this is where the Earth is at. And if you're at this part of the country here, you can see that the Earth is a little bit further from the Sun than it is if you're staying here. And therefore, because it's a little further from the Sun, this is the period which the people here will experience the winter season. Whereas if you're in this part of the Earth here, then you can see that the distance between the Earth and the Sun is closer. And that's when um, the weather gets a little bit hot. So it's the summertime. So in essence, it's the Earth tiltedness <laughs> that cause different hemisphere to receive varying the amount of sunlight, creating winter in one and summer in the other. If you look into the other diagram, it's the same thing here. And that's basically how it works. And for countries that located at the equator, which is around here. So for my country in Malaysia, um, it's located at the equator. So it, because it as it's at the equator, the distance between the Earth and also the Sun will always be the same. Hence, countries in the equator doesn't experience four seasons. So that's how, how you can explain um, why four seasons occur in last year exam. Great. So let's move on into the solar system. We know that the um, universe doesn't just contain the Earth, Sun, and also the Moon. It also contains many other planets like Mercury, um, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, so on and so forth. Should be Venus. So the other one and minor planets, Pluto and Aries. So these are the planets that are not in the um, solar system, but they are big enough to call planet. And also moons, the orbit planets. Um, do know that there isn't just one moon on, you know, that we, we can see now. There are many other moons that are surrounding different planets um, in the universe. And besides that, we also have something called this asteroid and meteors in the solar system and comets, which is a celestial object that um, looks like a snowball and they travel in a very irregular fashion. So how, the further it is from the sun, um, they, they move like that. So um, when they move close to the sun, they warm up and release a trail of gas and dust behind them. So that's just some facts and some objects that are in the solar system. And let's look into some of these um, planets and see how they are formed from the beginning. So first of all, 
Um, the solar system originated from a nebula, which is a massive rotating clouds of gas and dust. So everything comes from gas and dust. And what happened is that planets will then form from the leftover materials in the nebula that will not drain into the sun, that, that are not attracted into the sun. They remain there and slowly they accumulate and they form the planets. And the spinning motion of the nebula caused the formation of a flat rotating disk. So something like that um, before all the planets are formed. So this is called an accretion disk. And through accretion, smaller particles such as dust and gas were pulled together by gravity um, to form larger rocks. So as more and more particles are being attracted to this rock, they form what we have now today, um, the rocky planets. And as the um, other elements, all right, lighter materials that are pulled further away from the sun, they are they eventually form the outer planets known as the gas giant, which are all these planets here. All right, so that's how planets are formed in a very uh, summarized way. So in solar system, we don't, of course, we use um, kilometers as a unit to describe distance, but um, sometimes for convenience sake, we also use the term light year. Light year is not a time unit. It's not like one year. A light year is a distant unit. It measures how far the light travels in a year. So if let's say a plan two planets are one light year away, it means that the distance between them is the amount of distance that light can travel in a year. And we'll look into light years further in the next chapter. But for now, let's solve some questions regarding the distance between different objects in the solar system. So imagine, so just know that um, the distance between sun and the earth is this amount of distance. And then the, the question is, find out how many minutes it takes for light to travel from sun to the earth. And to solve this question, we need to know first how fast the light travel, because what we not need to do is um, we, t we need this formula, speed equal to distance over time. And because we want to find the time, you're going to have time equal to distance over speed. So we already know the distance and the speed of light will, will be 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. And in order to solve this question, I've solved it beforehand to save time. You first need to convert kilometer into meter and then that's write down the speed of light. Simply use the formula distance divided by speed and you will be getting 500 seconds, which is 8 minutes and 20 seconds. So that's um, some of the question. Um, that's how I solve it. So the other question is about moon and also the earth. And the distance between the earth and the moon is 390,000. Um, find out how much time for light to travel. Again, we will use the same formulas here. But then for now, the only thing that changes is the distance. So if I were to write that down, convert my kilometer into meter because it's an I unit and divide it by the speed of light, I'll get 1.3 seconds. That's how fast light can travel from the moon to the earth. So um, another thing about the solar system. So if you look at it, um, all we learned in this video is about the, some of the properties of solar system and what are the theories that hold everything together. For instance, how, how does this, how does planet um, form in this fashion? Why, why is it that the path that they travel is in circular fashion? And that's because of the sun's gravitational pull. If you remember in chapter eight, um, yeah, we learned that to keep something moving in a circle, the force has to be directed towards the center. So the sun is the main object that provides the gravitational pull, which causes the planets and also the other objects to travel in a circular fashion. So that's basically it. And also force. Um, just some facts here, the sun is positioned at the solar center of the solar system and it's the most massive object, that means it contains the most mass. And the strength of the gravitational field is considerably higher than any other objects. So because gravitational acceleration depends on mass, because it's very heavy, it exerts a lot of gravitational force. And this gravitational force, as mentioned, they hold all this object, travel planets traveling in um, circular fashion. So 
gravitational attraction decreases with distance, meaning the planets here, like further from the sun, the least, the, the less gravitational pull is going to experience from the sun. So that's just some facts. And also orbits and energy. And if you look at, look at it, um, the planets here, they don't travel, they don't orbit in a circular fashion. In fact, it's a little bit elliptical, like an over. So that's how we describe the shape of the orbit. We call it elliptical. And how much it is, like how over it is, um, there's a term for it called eccentricity. All right. So that's just some keyword and vocabularies. And the reason be why these orbits are elliptical is because initially the object was traveling quickly past the sun due to its own momentum. But as the object moved further and further from the sun, the sun gravity began to pull it towards itself. This causes the object to speed up. So speed up and then slow down and come back to the sun again. So this explains why is it that the shape of the orbit is elliptical. So some of the energies involved is kinetic energy. It is highest when near when it's nearby the sun because uh, of the sun's gravitational attraction. But then um, once it's moved away from the sun, gradually it has less kinetic energy. So it started slowing down and then go back to the sun again. And that's when the point here is when the planets or the comets have the highest gravitational potential energy. Great. So um, let's look into the last subtopic of this video, which is speed. H how do we measure how fast, um, let's say, Earth orbits around the sun? Um, one way to do this is to use the formulas. And before we look into formula, we need to understand what is called the orbital radius. So the arrow that I'm drawing here is the orbital radius, which is the average distance of the planet from the sun or the average radius of the orbits. And understanding the radius is important. If you remember what we learned in math, um, if you have the radius, you can calculate the circumference, which is around here. And the way we calculate the circumference is by using the formula 2 pi r. So by calculating the circumference, we'll be able to know the distance that is traveled by the Earth. And therefore, if you want to calculate how fast the Earth orbits the um, sun, we can simply use the formula 2 pi r, r is the orbital radius, divided by orbital period, which is how long does it take for Earth to travel just one cycle. And if you have that, this is the distance. Distance divided by time, it will give us the speed. And hence, that's um, where you get the average orbital speed. You need the orbital radius and also the orbital period. And that's it. So um, last but not least, we'll talk about planetary pattern. So these are some of the data gathered by um, the scientists there to analyze and compare behavior and properties of planets, which is, look, we look at different data. For instance, will the orbital distance um, between a planet affects how long, how many moons it has, for instance. So by listing all the data down, we can see whether certain property, they, do they have a relationship? And if we look at the first two columns here, it's very obvious that the average, the longer the orbital distance, the lower the orbital duration. Because if you look, think about it, it makes sense because it requires less time to travel. And, but for the other properties, it might not be so straightforward. Hence, to identify whether they are relationship, we often draw something called a scatter plot. So, um, in this example here, I'm using the number of moons and also the gravitational field strength to just see whether these, whether one field will affect the other field or not. And if we look at it, you can see that the higher the gravitational field, uh, we can see a pattern, even though it's not very consistent. But then the greater the gravitational field strength, it seems that the, the more moons the planet will have. I mean, of course, we have exception. But um, what this scatter plot already do for us is to help us to identify whether there is a very straightforward relationship or whether there is um less straightforward relationship. And that's when um, planetary patterns comes into play. You might be required to draw it. So um, just know, just plot them in the correct x and y axis. And then you shall be able to see whether there is a relationship. And that's about it for this chapter. And what we look into it today is just a basic introduction of 
how uh, we experience day, month, and also year, and also the properties and some of the objects that are in the solar system. And in the next video, we're going to be looking for more exciting things. So stay tuned. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.